being racist in the United Kingdom, it means that you can do the manual jobs, the lower income jobs, right? So the cleaning, the washing, the, you know, the, the small, small jobs that the Englishman would not do. So I saw an opportunity then and I opened my business as a courier driver, so transport sector. So I would take from A, and I was sent to B. So Abigail had to train this person because they didn't know what they were doing. But then after she trained the person to do the job that she was doing, the person got promoted for the role that she was asking and for the money that she was asking. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's institutional racism, yeah. So you fit, you fit the description, you can do the job, but for some reason, you still do not fit the criteria. So then you have to train the person that doesn't know how to do the job, but they fit the benchmark, whiteness. So then that's, that's what happened to her in two separate incidents. Yeah, we had saved our money, 20,000 pounds, and we were ready to buy a house. It must have been God and the devil working together, but everyone we asked for advice, mortgage advisors, they said we didn't have enough money to buy a house, a deposit to buy a house. We had a meeting as a family and I literally had to say, look, we're basically gonna eat this money. We're gonna eat 20,000 pounds if we don't put it somewhere. Mm. So we have to think deep and far. The only place that we think would give us a better return for our coin is going to be Ghana. Mm. With what we have, we'll be able to invest in this and get something in return. So Ghana is not for everybody. Mm. It has um, a beauty to it that I think hits you when you first land here because of the nightlife. So you have the nightlife, you have this, that, da, 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 the currency exchange, right, fantastic. After two weeks into the month, now the, the, the honeymoon phase wears out and now you start seeing the realities. Hello guys, so welcome back again to another amazing episode and this is the Diaspora Transition episode where we have dialogue with Diaspora who decided to relocate onto the continent. Uh, this, today we do have here someone very special. There are couples who decided to, you know, come test the waters, try to move back, you know, here uh, to Ghana. You know, they do have a project they are working on, real estate, building houses, home for families. Uh, newly wedded. Yes. <laughs> About what, five years? Just two months. Two months? In May, yeah. New birth. Love in the building. So um, I would like them to introduce themselves. So without further ado, Nana and Abigail, welcome on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank Congratulations. You. Thanks. Thank you. Early days, yeah. yeah. Two months. Yeah. Literally. That's yeah. pretty fresh. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. People are watching you for the first time. Can you please briefly introduce yourself um, to them watching you know, for the first time? So my name is Nana. Mm -hmm. I was born in Italy, mm. um, but I'm currently transitioning from living in the UK, mm -hmm. in London, to Ghana. Mm. And uh, my background was in quantity surveying, but I never worked in quantity surveying. And um, in the That's UK, your university? Um, that what was a diploma, diploma, so high school. Quantity yeah. surveying. Yeah, quantity diploma. surveying, yes. I never went to uni. Okay. Um, I didn't want to. And um, so um, I moved to the UK in 2015. Mm. Uh, in 2016, I started a company and uh, I met Abigail, my uh, then girlfriend and today wife. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Abigail. Yes. Yeah. I'm Abigail. Um, British, Jamaican and yeah, transitioning to Ghana. I didn't go to university either actually, so that's something we have in common. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was too expensive. So I just, I just never went, went straight to work. Um, went into uh, property management and we're here today. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. But you know, before we dive into, you know, Ghana and how, you know, you guys transition here, you know, you have a building project. I've seen the architecture of it, which is very beautiful. Before we even talk about how that started, let's speak about your upbringing a little bit, growing up. Uh, where did you grow up? How was it like in the UK? Mm -hmm. um, did you grow up with both parents? You, you Jamaica, uh, your parents are Jamaican and yes. whatnot. Walk me through that to a point where you decided not to go to college and that made you uh, meet your 
uh, husband and then you also do the same as well. Yeah. So um, I'm from a very large household. My parents are still together. I've got uh, five brothers, so there's six of us in total. And it was a very strict Christian upbringing, um, very Caribbean. I would say in, in the UK, mm. I was born and raised in East London, so in the UK, um, Caribbean culture is sort of a culture within a culture. So you've got your British culture and then you've got this sort of like your British Caribbean culture. So mm -hmm. I would say very much British Caribbean, you know, the hall parties, the big people parties, you know. Um, so everybody else went to uni. Um, one of my brothers dropped out of uni, but everybody else went and I just thought, I just didn't know what to do. Um, and my dad had always been, he's a pastor, um, and he had always been very adamant or when we were younger he'd been teaching us a lot about sort of African history mm. about slavery about you know being proud of yourself and proud of your skin color um, and that's always something that has stuck with me so sort of growing up I always knew that I didn't want to be with a white person really? um, and white people didn't want to be with me anyway so <laughs> I didn't want to be with a white person um, and I always knew it was going to be someone African. I always knew it was going to be someone African. I think my parents knew it was going to be someone African. So when we kind of met each other and he was saying all the right things and, you know, he was very switched on, very conscious in that way, um, I thought, I've got to catch this one. So, yes, <laughs> that's what I did, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what was standing out? Conscious? What, what would you say she was, he was conscious? Mm. What does that look like? Please exactly. that timeline for me real quick. There's certain conversations I feel like you can have with a conscious person. Um, they're switched on differently when you're sort of out and about in the world. It's not just, you know, you're looking at it through a different lens. Mm. And I think when we would have conversations about sort of our, our, our issues sort of growing up in the UK or growing up in Italy um, or even the wider issues facing the black community we were sort of on the same page about it so I think that's what definitely drew us to each other yeah interesting yeah uh, so you, you found each other how long ago 2015 15 yeah I see. yeah I see. that's amazing yeah um, Nana that's right. a typical Ghanaian name typical how can you be a Ghanaian and be born in Italy how does how does this right. work so I, I haven't had a straightforward upbringing as Abigail has had. Mm -hmm. um, so my parents uh, moved to Italy in the 80s and uh, they met in uh, probably 88 and I was born in 89. Mm -hmm. But then soon after that they split up. So they were not married, they were living together. They split up and um, I came to live in Ghana with my paternal grandparents. Mm -hmm. So there was a court case. The case um, was won by my mom, but then my dad was able to overrule the case. We, we, we don't go into the details, but something happened. And then he was able to have custody of me. And then we came back to, the U, um, to Italy. We moved back to Italy and then I went into foster care. So I went to live with white people, Italians. This was a traditional Italian household middle class so I was brought up with Italian values I was brought up with Italian thinking and you know whatever you can think of white people in an Italian context and um, so I did that but the, the terms and conditions of the foster care was that I would leave with my dad on the weekends mm -hmm. and in the weekdays when I'm going to school I'll stay with my foster parents so I was super spoiled uh, you know um, I was given everything I wanted. We had two big holidays a year, skiing and going to the sea. So I was, I was very, very um, Italian, not in touch with my African roots. Mm. So up until I was um, around 10 years old, my dad then took me out of foster care into a boarding school. Mm. I went into a boarding school and this was an African oriented boarding school in Italy. So uh, it was run by Nigerians uh, for the sake of um, privacy, I'm not going to name the school, but it was run by a Nigerian principal. So we were taught African history. Um, it was just like being in an African boarding school, but not in Africa. Mm. So that kind of gave me the African consciousness a bit. I started seeing myself as black, 
rather than European or white. I started identifying with my name. So I finished that school at the age of 14, just about, I did my GCSEs. And then I went back into the Italian school. So went back into the Italian school. Now I was struggling mm. because now um, I was very good at speaking English. I was very good at comprehending stuff in English, but not in Italian. So um, I had to now pick up my Italian mannerisms again. And uh, that's when I started noticing the racism because I, f mm. I felt a bit more innocent than the other kids. You know, it's like, I'm not Italian, but I was born in Italy. So yeah, I, I started feeling the racism and, uh, and I just knew that, look, I need, to, I need to move away from Italy if I want to do something big for myself. Mia Santini, I always say this. So I like big things. I want to do well for myself. I want to do well for my family. Um, I have a big lineage of ancestors behind me. And, you know, you have to set the way for the ones that are coming as well. So I knew I had to go to the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So leaving, the, leaving Italy behind and going to the UK. Yeah. I mean, you, you realized that they were being racist to you there in Italy. Yeah. Did that change going to the UK? If it didn't, how did you maneuver your way through that to a point of even opening your own business? How did that business do? How did people react to you being black and having that kind of business that you, you had? Can we speak on that a little bit? So in Italy, the type of racism that is in Italy is different to the one in um, the um, English speaking countries. Mm. So Italy has not had a history or a successful history of colonization. So they haven't had to adapt their economy, their, their lifestyle, their culture to, to other races. They've only had Italians to take care of. So in Italy, racism is based on, um, uh, on whether they like you or they don't. Mm. So if, if they just don't like you as a person, you're not friendly, you don't speak the language, you don't eat what they eat, you don't respect the holidays that they respect or the environment, all these things, then they don't like you. They, they, exactly. That's kind of the racism they have. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the UK, you can be whoever you are, but the racism is institutionalized. Mm -hmm. So what I've come to understand is that the, um, the unit of measure that they have taken in English speaking countries is that of a white person. Mm -hmm. And you, the black person, Indian, black and brown, or whatever nationality race you come from you need to adapt to this standard so that is why i come to understand as institutionalized mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so you you can eat whatever you like to eat you can also not respect the environment do whatever you want but the institution has been you know the the benchmark has been set based on whiteness so if you want to succeed you want to um, even standards of beauty for example you need to um, follow standards of beauty of whiteness so thin long hair light skin etc etc so um, as an institution being racist in the um, in, in the United Kingdom it means that you can do the menial jobs the lower income jobs right so the cleaning the washing the you know the, the small small jobs that the Englishman would not do so I saw an opportunity then and I opened my business as a courier driver, so transport sector. So I would take from A and I was sent to B and I was doing um, as a subcontractor. So I didn't have my own contracts. So I did that up until the pandemic. Mm. So just before the pandemic, I was able to secure a contract with a big company. And then during the pandemic, as everything shut down, it, it wasn't even secure that my job was going to be secure. So they just canceled the contract and I was left at home. But that was where the crucial, I would say, the eye opening events started happening for both of us. We were all living together in the UK by then. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you were born in the UK, right? Yes. You also went to white schools, like mm -hmm. your husband did. How was that like? Oh, East London is, or was I should say, it's getting a bit gentrified now, but it was very, very mixed. You had African, Caribbean and Asian, East Asian, uh, Southeast Asian, sorry. So 
in that sense, it was very mixed. You were aware that you were all quote unquote coloured people. So in the school that I went to, it, not that it was unusual, but there was probably a handful of, of white people in, in your class um, or, or even in the school. It was very, very um, multicultural, I should say. So in that way, you could, at least growing up, you could still be in your little bubble. You know, the Asians were still very much in, in their bubble and being raised in their Asian culture. Caribbeans were very much raised in a Caribbean culture and the Africans were very much raised in, in the African culture. So it's really when you grew up and you go out into sort of like the white world and the English world, that's when something that you can't explain kicks in and I think that's where the institutionalization comes from because that's what makes it so subtle. You won't, you won't even realize that this is the reason I'm not being promoted, this is the reason why I can't get certain, certain things in life. This is the reason why somebody looks at me or, or comments uh, sort of in a, in, a, in a way that you can't quite put your finger on because it's so ingrained. Whereas I feel like the difference in maybe America or, or maybe Italy is, is point blank. You mm. know, this is because of your skin color, blah, blah, blah. Where yeah. Because it's, it's deep into the laws, it's into the, the psyche in the UK. You, you don't even notice that it's happening. So that's where I think the racial consciousness is very, very key in somewhere like the UK. It, it's almost, it's important for your own survival because you just think you're going crazy, like, oh, you're, you're working harder to be promoted to get up on the ladder, but you will never get there because because you are black. And if you do get there, you'll be one of two, one of three, mm. um, and you're, you're just seen as a token. So I think racial consciousness in the UK is, is a must for your own mm. for your own survival there, mm. yeah. So you feel like there was a ceiling above you 100 percent i've been i've been in the property sector since what was it 2015 since yes. 2015 yes um so that's a long time now and i remember in a, a few previous jobs just before well when the pandemic hit um i'd been asking for like a raise for a while and i didn't get it didn't get it so i left that job and i had a few friends that were still in that job and they said that the person that was hired after me was was white, had long hair, you know, the whole fit the bill, and she got exactly what she she got more than what I was asking for. So that's when I kind of realised, okay, there's there's Is something going on here. She's providing this kind of value that you you, can, you are not providing at that time, or just because you are black. That's the thing. These are all the reasons that they'll mm. give you first. This person has more qualifications. This person's um, got the experience. This person is X, Y, Z. They will list all of that first. So even you as a black person will think, oh, okay, do you know what? Yeah, it is because of X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. But I had the qualifications. I had the experience. You know, you usually want to hire from within in a company. But when that wasn't happening, you then play, you know, the only card that you have left. And I think that's also... In the UK, we don't actually want to play the race card. We really don't. We just want to get by. We want to, you know, provide yeah. for our families, get on the housing ladder, do well in life. So for us in the UK, I would say that's the last card that you want to play. But when you have no other options left and that's your only expl explanation, okay, you, you see it for what it is. Yeah. Mm. I will also add that um, regarding this incident, I think if it's the same person, mm she had to train the person that took her role and become promoted so you had to train her for a little two separate bit. incidents yeah. actually even. so so, you, so it's not that she wasn't qualified so it means that she was even overqualified. so abigail had to train this person because they didn't know what they were doing but then after she trained the person to do the job that she was doing the person got promoted for the role that she was asking and for the money that she was asking yeah. yeah that's that's institutional racism yeah so you fit you fit the description you can do the job but for some reason you still do not fit the criteria so then you have to train the person that doesn't know how to do the job but they fit the benchmark whiteness so then that's that's what happened to her in two separate incidents yeah is that them reminding you that this is not your country, this is where, you're, this, where it's not where you're from. Mm. You have, is that how to remind? Yeah, yeah. so in, in my mind, you know, that's when I have sort of like the teachings of, from what my dad was telling me in the back of my head, you know, be proud of who you are, this, is, you know, this isn't where you're from, you know, we're from Africa, we're, you know, that kind of 
um, language, that's when that all starts to sort of kick in. And I was then reading my own books, doing my own research on, on black history. And I just thought, this isn't the place for me. You know, I, it's, it, the pandemic did a lot for us, but mm. I remember saying to him, it almost feels like you're a prisoner of war. And that might sound very, very dramatic to some people that, no, this is where I was born and raised. I love the UK. I love my British culture. That's absolutely fine. But if you go far enough into the history, or not even far enough, if you look into the history of the UK or, or any of you know the colonies, you are a prisoner of war. And you just happen to be here. You happen to then carry on. Didn't bother. Well, bother is a, is a you know strong word. But you didn't bother to go back to your country or to look into your history. And you're here suffering because of it. Mm. And your children are suffering because of it. Yeah. Mm. I agree with you. Because just the same way, like, you go into someone's home as a helper in the beginning mm. of it. I think even though the, the person will be good, they will take you to school. You know mm. how the whole... There's no way you, you'll be treated better than that yeah. person's own son. 100%. Is it? Yeah. 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 So that reminds you that you don't fit in here. And it's not like you don't have a home to go to. You're mm. Jamaican, he's mm. Ghanaian. Did, did that trigger your moving to Ghana? You said 2019 did something for you guys. Yeah, the pandemic. Pandemic yeah. did something for yeah. you guys. So let's just dive that into that. What happened in your psyche during the pandemic that triggered what we are living in now? So physically, having to stop for two years, not um, earning money, having to still pay the bills of, of you know the shopping and everything but not being able to earn money and living off our savings you you start to think your brain starts to move in a different way because um you're in prison you're, it's basically prison now you can only stay in and go out for one hour a day yeah. so that's jail right so during that time you do a lot of thinking and um, we were also planning to buy a house. We had saved our money, 20,000 pounds, mm. and we were ready to buy a house. Mm. Now, it must have been God and the devil working together, but everyone we asked for advice, mortgage advisors, they said we didn't have enough money to buy a house, a deposit to buy a house. So the way it works in the UK, you pay a deposit, 10% deposit, and then um, you get a mortgage, and then you pay a mortgage every, every, every month. Um, and so on. So um, everyone we spoke to, they said we, we don't fit, we can't, we need to save more money, we need to save more money. So we had a meeting as a family and I literally had to say, look, um, we're basically going to eat this money. We're going to eat £20,000 if we don't put it somewhere. Mm. So we had to think deep and far. Now, the only option, we thought of Jamaica, we thought of Ghana. We thought of even Italy and Spain. We thought of other countries. And we had to dig deep and say, look, the only place that we think would give us a better return for our coin is going to be Ghana. Mm. With what we have, we'd be able to invest in this and get something in return. We didn't know what we were doing. But I would also say maybe it was guidance from the ancestors, God and the devil working together that maybe helped us to make that decision. And we just said, look, we're going to put our money into Ghana and we bought a plot of land. And the rest literally went into expenses, mm. literally, because we were not earning nothing, mm. yeah. Mm. Interesting, now, on what metrics did you use or what metrics did you use that gave you the assurance that Ghana would give you that kind of, you know, advantage to your, getting your ROIs and, and whatnot? Again, having all that free time kicked in, um, we were watching a lot of YouTube videos, yeah. um, a lot of a lot of social media, and we were seeing stories of people just really going back to Ghana. A lot of Americans, a lot of British citizens, going back to Ghana, and we were like, "What's what's here?" You know, we had been the year before during yeah. what was it the year, the of, year return. of return? So yeah. we had been just the year before, and we had a great time. It was a great holiday, but we were like, "Why are people?" flooding back to Ghana and having businesses, moving their whole lives. Some people were coming back with like 200 pounds, yeah. which is not enough to survive, but they were yeah. doing it anyway. Yeah. So that's when we really started diving in and, and looking at, okay, what, what is it that these people have um, that we don't have or that we might have as well that we can sort of um, take inspiration from. So mm -hmm. that's when the YouTube videos helped. And then we started looking into sort of our own sort of like economic videos as well, where people are looking at the real trajectory that Ghana is going in. Yeah. 
um, you know, the same trajectory as, as a country like China, yeah. you know. Um, Dubai. Yeah, so we were looking yeah. at a lot of that and that's what sort of nailed the decision for mm. us, yeah. Mm. And I've seen, I've seen the work you guys are doing and I've started and I think it takes a lot of skills to be able to develop something like that, even the building architecture and everything. Did you guys have any experience building whatever, or it, it, how did you learn that craft? Of I would say it takes skills and mistakes okay. yeah. because we've made a lot of mistakes. We've made yeah. a lot of sort of wrong decisions and have had to maneuver out of them. Mm -hmm. um, we've had to build relationships here in Ghana yeah. um, because, like anywhere in the world, you can't just sort of trust the first person you see and the first person you come across. Um, so we. Again, we've got um, experience in, in the property sector anyway, yeah. so that gave us a little bit of an edge. Um, but I think just learning from our mistakes yeah. as well has been really, really key for us. Yeah. 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 To, to add to what Abigail just said, so after the pandemic, because the laws and the legislations in the UK changed in, um, in the sector that I was working in, in business-wise, I also had to change and adapt to you know the, the the country's laws so i just saw an opportunity in um, doing property maintenance right so uh, we now started working together so um, when she would have a contract for a building then i would go out and maintain the property so that's how we started and then just recently in april we got our license so now we are a franchise as a com as a company, the so franchise. yes, we can license out um, the work to other subcontractors. Yeah, and contractors. What goes yeah. into property management? So property management is maintaining the building. You're doing the painting, the plumbing, the flooring, carpeting, anything that needs to be done to maintain the building in a pristine state. So we would say in an optimal state the um, the tenants need, need to enjoy the building mm -hmm. clean and whatever comes with it yeah so that would be property ma uh, maintenance yeah mm -hmm. yeah now you, you now build it right mm -hmm. so um the vision to build came from um i don't know if we can say but the vision to build came from wadamaya mm -hmm. right so um we follow a lot of the Ghanaian creatives. We follow you and everyone else. So um, there was this one video where Wadamaya was saying he wanted to build himself a big house and live in it and be comfortable. And then he had advice from a Nigerian entrepreneur that literally told him, look, you're young. Why don't you think about making money? So then build to sell. So oh, that's a fantastic idea. But because we had bought one plot we're like, how are we going to build one house and sell? You can't put all your eggs in one basket. So I was, it was, it was literally a think tank up and down with thinking. And um, we found a few websites, we were consulting. And so we came up with the idea, right, um, since Pram Pram, where we are currently developing, is a beach town, there would be a lot of people that would benefit from having a holiday home right whether it's for investment whether it's for retirement or whether it's for their own uh, residence so why don't we then build apartments let's build apartments let's have swimming pools in this apartment let's have a gym let's let it feel like their home so it will be home away from home in a beach town they can have the ocean close by and they can have the quietness of the location of where the the property is situated so that you know lit switched on the lights for me so from there i started going deeper and deeper into the idea of having apartments and then we consulted Ghanaian architects to get everything done for us and the magic happened from there yeah mm, interesting i like the story you, you said about when am i getting an advice from the entrepreneur yeah i, I also met a nigerian youth he's about 27 years old who built like story building apartment yeah. complex for students okay and when you see the building it's not very encouraging mm. you'd be like oh i'll never live here as a developer as a someone who are getting into the business it's, 
He's almost like, oh, I can never leave you. And he's, he said one thing, you're not developing for yourself. You're developing, you're developing other for other people. people. Exactly. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. I think yeah. that really clicked. And even my dad always said the same thing. Sometimes we want to just build this machine yeah. when we get my bike. That's not the way forward. You have to just yeah. build small, small, you know, serve the people first. Yeah. You know, and then maybe in your retirement, you can build yourself a mansion. So yeah. that really starts taking me. But let's just dive back to the, even the real estate, the future of real estate, and why that makes sense for people to jump into it now. I mean, Ghana is an emerging market. Yeah. Um, Ghana GDP. What's Ghana GDP was 10 years ago, it's not what it is now. It's right? 10 years ago, yeah. And the, the real estate market is contributing so much to the Ghana GDP. And you yeah. see that increase from the next 5 to 10 years. What have you seen on that trajectory that you think people watching should, you know, kind of... Yeah, so the, the real estate market in Ghana is very hard. Mm. It's very, very hard, but it is the most rewarding. Mm. So with the little investment and there is a saying in ghana that uh, buy land and wait don't wait to buy land mm. so make the sacrifice of investing little by little into it whether it is um, the land first of all whether it's um, taking action and owning the land whether it's uh, the planning um, whatever you need to do for the land or, or for the real estate sector, you need to be serious about it because it's going to be rewarding in the next 10, 15, 20 years, right? Yeah. So this is something that we noticed. Every time we came to Ghana, say, um, you know, where we're renting, would, uh, would ask for housing advice or um, how much does this property cost? How much does that property cost? I would always realize that it doesn't reflect the environment. Mm. So the property is always more expensive than what the environment looks like, what the neighborhood looks like. And for me, from the background I had in quantity surveying, that means that there's a growing population and there's an increase in middle class, right? It's going to catch up eventually. The neighborhood will catch up with, with what the buildings look like. The roads are going to get tiled. The, um, the drainage is going to get done, electricity is catching up. So I just understood that, look, um, this is probably where Dubai was in the 90s. This is probably where China was in the 80s or 70s. We need to get in now because in the next 30 years, everything is going to be locked up and, and you know, we'll be out. This, this is a conversation some people are having even about Accra that you know 20 years ago it was it was a booming market whoever didn't get in 20 years ago good night and sayonara i was in a meeting with the fellow real estate um friends whatnot and they were speaking about a property in east Lebanon hills a lunch yeah that i think one of them bought okay and convinced uh, another eight whatever client to come by because this real estate in you know, east Lebanon hills area is going to develop and he's like, this is a bush. Why are you, why are you bringing it here, right? Yeah. And he said at that time it was 250,000 uh, cities. Okay. Right. And then the guy never paid any attention to him. Eight months fast forward. Yeah. He started, that guy, that client started he hearing rumors about it, you know. The it, area it's, developing. Exactly. Yeah. So he came back and like, you know what? He told the realtor, take me there. I want to buy the land now. So sure, come with me, no problem. So show him around. He's mm -hmm. like, look, I'm, I'm happy. I want to make a decision now. Mm -hmm. Here's your 250,000. He said, no, it's not. It's Yesterday's it's, price it's, it's is not today's price. It's 500,000 now, mm -hmm. yeah. which is that, that time around $50,000. Yeah. Now, as I'm speaking to you right now, you can't get a land in yeah. one plot in East Lebanon Hills. Yeah. Less than 100,000. You can't, right? Yeah. So it, it, yeah. This tells you how, you know, it is. Yeah. So I, myself, I want to do real estate. Um, nice. I just bought an acre that I want to do an experiment mm -hmm. with, build nice. affordable homes. Wish me luck. <laughs> nice. Very you guys. Good luck, me. man. But um, let's give advice to our fellow diasporans. You know, sometimes it's very hard for us to see the mission, yeah. see the trajectory that we Africa is on. It's almost like we just want to make an assessment, and if the assessment doesn't look fancy and all glamorous right now we don't make decisions we just stay in the uk or us um but on the other hand other chinese lebanese 
they do projections, right? Yeah. So they know where the market is going to be yeah. in the next five to ten years, and they position themselves now. Right, but for some reason, we are always late mm-hmm. to the party. Um, can we speak on that a little bit? I think my advice would be to stop and think. Mm. Um, having the time and the space to think is very, very valuable. You know, they say time is money, all these expressions about time, time, time. And I think something, the things that we're struggling with that, that stop you from that, or even the average person that is mm. struggling with is having a full-time job. Yeah. You know, I don't have the time to stop and think or then having to come home and you know, feed your kids or go to the gym. Your time is always taken up. Um, let alone, you know, the distractions of, you know, movies or social life and, and all that jazz. Um, stopping and thinking did a lot for us. Yeah. And I think um, keeping our options open, we didn't uh, restrict ourselves in saying, right, yeah, we're just going to build the house. We're going to, you know, do what loads of people's parents did and, and just build, build, build until they, you know, one day drop dead and hopefully have left that house for their kids. Um, we didn't box ourselves in, we left it quite open. So I think, yeah, time and keeping your, your thoughts open on it is, that would be my advice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, what I'd say as well is that um, the way we're doing our transition is uh, by staircasing it. So at every um, goal that we're able to successfully complete, we try to stay longer in Ghana. So we were learning from the YouTube videos, we're learning from people who've had negative experiences and we're not taking it as, right, this is not for us. We're just learning from it and saying, right, what did they do wrong and what can we do better? So, right, maybe moving cold turkey might not be the answer for us. Maybe doing it gradually, you know? this goes well right we stay longer this goes well we stay longer and another realization that we've had with ourselves is that um ghana is a great place but we are human beings and we like to travel so we are also experimenting leaving seasonally so we want to live in ghana we want to live in the caribbean we want to live in asia because the world is for humans to live in Mm -hmm. so uh We shouldn't limit ourselves to say, right, we only want to stay here, only stay here. No, we're not giving ourselves that limit. Mm -hmm. We want to stay where we want to feel home, you know, at home. Yeah. 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 I would say also another thing is sacrifice. Yeah. I think as as black people, we really want something now. We want that reward now, now, now. Um, Nothing comes without sacrifice. We are very quick to say, you know, the, the Chinese do it like this or the Asians do it like that, they have had their time of sacrifice. They very much have. And I think, even if you think, right, I, I don't know where to start, and you're starting from scratch, 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 and you don't have two pennies to rub together, um, how am I gonna save money? Can you move back home? Is yeah. there a family member that you can live with? Is there a cousin that you can talk to or a friend that you can go into business with and be like, right, I know that you're the one serious family member. Yeah. Let's save our money bit by bit. You know, there are institutions or, or cultural, even the susu, you yeah. can take advantage of that in, in uh, the Caribbean, we call it the partner. You can take advantage of that um, and come together that way but nothing comes without sacrifice. Mm. And then you can make the bigger sacrifices to get you to that bigger reward. Yeah. So I think you really have to think ahead in, in that way. Mm. Yeah. What are some of the sacrifices you guys had to make? Oh, it's moving back um, into a family. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, leaving our, our private abode, moving back into her family's house. Mm. Uh, I think that has been the biggest sacrifice for me mm. and for us, uh, yeah. for, for mental health, physical <laughs> health, spiritual health, financial health. It's, it's, it, it was necessary, but it's been the biggest sacrifice so far. Yeah. 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 How, how is it living in Ghana like? I mean, day to day, you know, how is it? Have you adjusted completely? Are you now adjusting? Hmm. What are some of your difficulties and whatnot? So Ghana is not for everybody. Mm. It has um, a beauty to it that I think hits you when you first land here because of the nightlife. So you have the nightlife, you have this, that, da 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 da, the currency exchange, right, fantastic. After two weeks, 
and um, into the month now the the, the honeymoon phase <laughs> you know wears out and now you start seeing the realities water shorts you know the the cut the water supply electricity might run out and then the currency thing starts not to be advantageous because now inflation exactly people people also know you're new you're fresh so they 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 put their own price the inflation price on top of you know so <laughs> you, you you start to it starts to wear off but after that something happens which i think we've come to realize which is um that's the price of freedom that is the price of freedom as in they can live this way but we can also live this way authentically so like everywhere give it time study what the locals do adapt to what the locals do and obviously you know um, we have this saying where um, if you go on holiday and you still go to the Marriott the resorts it's not really a holiday it's just a white space in another country live with the locals understand what the locals do and maybe that would help you adapt better better to the country yeah let's talk about the building a little bit um what is the projection i see this is a one plot land yep that you guys will be building you know on from that point where else you know do you guys have plan um so elaborate on that a little bit so um we want to be signature property developers right so uh, we're working our way backwards as in this is how much we need to live authentically on this earth in ghana or wherever we want to live this is the kind of service or this is the kind of work we want to provide that would grant us this standard of living okay so uh, doing it as a as signature um, developers we're not building in quantity we're building in quality so uh, there's um, there's a detail that would be put into the buildings we do um, even the type of person that purchases our building they need to be of a certain caliber right they need to pass our questions uh, you don't you know it's, it's not like oh we're looking down on people it's more like we want the right person to live in the right space, to take advantage of the right amenities. This is what we want to be. So now from here, we would do a development every year, every other year, based on the inspiration that we also get. Because we also don't want to do it as a competition, right? We've made 50K this year, next year we want to make 100K, no. We, this year, how many satisfied customers have we had? Off camera, we had a conversation and um, you said that the person that is able to unlock customer service in Ghana is a billionaire, right? Yeah. So that can only happen if we focus on quality, yeah. not on quantity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very true. This is, this is the biggest problem. Every, mm -hmm. I, was, I went to the cinema and I'm, I was just telling the person that I was with that she should just watch. Within the next five minutes, at least two or three things would go wrong. <laughs> the guy was printing my receipt, half of the receipt mm -hmm. came, the rest didn't. Mm -hmm. I was buying popcorn, I wanted um, salt, the guy mixed salt and sugar together. Mm -hmm. And it, this is under one minute, five things, wow. everything was wrong. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. like, can't we just have a perfect service? The it, thing is, even, sorry to cut you, even mm -hmm. if it's not perfect, yeah. that's where, um, again, I'm thinking like back home, like in the UK, that's where like something like banter would come in. Yeah. You'd then sort of speak to your customer and be like, oh, look, this receipt is not, not coming, you know, this happens every other day, ha ha ha, we've laughed it off, that tension is gone, yeah. you know? So even if something isn't perfect, what are you then doing as a person? Change to, everything. To, yeah. Okay, then he didn't react to it right away. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you know, saying that, I mean, just to touch on, there's a lot of problems here. Yeah. It shows that there's an opportunity. Yeah. And anybody who can solve these problems mm -hmm. yeah. then would get paid for that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so speak, what are some opportunities you think are out here that people watching can literally just come in here, invest into, fix them, solve them, that might, you know, give them some returns in the long run or whatnot? What based on your own assessment so um this is 
this is black pill mm -hmm. right now. We're going into black pill space. So um, we've coined it black pill for a reason. I think um, um, coming to Africa and wearing the African lens and taking the African black pill, then you can solve the African problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, customer service is one, mm -hmm. connectivity mm -hmm. is another one, internet. Mm. Um, you go to a lot of public spaces, there is no free internet. But again, it's because we are also not seeing the opportunity, right? Um, there is a very um, organized group of young boys in Ghana called the um, Bus Stop Boys, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They started it as a charity, they still do it as charity, mm -hmm. but they have now opened another market, which is uh, they, they'd been marketeers. So any company that latches onto their brand is, is exposed mm -hmm. to what they're doing, you know, the exposure they get. So that is another thing. Cleanliness, hygiene, that's another opportunity. Uh, it's not always, you know, the, um, the food and drinks sector that is getting saturated at the moment. There are other, other things that can be done. Mm -hmm. So I just gave you three there. Mm -hmm. So customer service, connectivity, internet provider, and, um, and cleanliness, hygiene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can give you more, but then yeah. there will be a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That makes sense. That makes mm -hmm. sense. I'd like to touch on the, the difficult topics people don't want to touch on. Yeah. I watched a video of you. It was an interview yeah. where you were speaking about black taxes yeah. within the African society. Yeah. Do you want to speak on that? <laughs> so, again, within the, the, the black pill, mm -hmm. you know, consciousness, mm -hmm. the black tax is basically uh, the tax that is put on the member of the family in, in the black world that is successful or that has traveled outside or that is even coming from abroad. Mm -hmm. it, as long as he's black, there is this... Um, there is this programming within us that says, right, since he's the crab that has made it out of the bucket, he needs to get all of us out of this bucket now. Mm. That is the black tax. So and everybody start pulling you. Exactly. Yeah. So he, he, you know, the tall puppy syndrome. So now because he's got money, he needs to give us all money because he's got a, a car. He needs to give us all a ride because he's got a house. We need to all sleep in his house. Um, he needs to give us maintenance fees, you know, um, you know, give parents money, which don't get me wrong. Y y there is an aspect of it which makes sense. But you also understand that parents have a shorter life to live as opposed to a young person. They've got all their life in front of them. How would they be able to have a successful start? if they are paying their parents who are going to be shortly gone. Mm. This, is some, this is a realization that we also need to have. Mm. That is the black tax. You're, you're constantly being billed mm. for being successful, sometimes even, even handsome or beautiful. Or even looking successful. Mm. Yeah, yeah, even, yeah, yeah. In Ghana, they call him the pre-man. Yeah, pre you know? yeah, yeah, the pre-man. He looks the part, yeah. so he must have something to it. So, let me go and dig in there. That's the black tax. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How do you think we can stop that? Because that is really draining. You see a young man who loves his family very much, but have an amount of money yeah. that can obviously start something for himself. It's not yeah. that much that would go a very long way if mm. he's giving to everybody else, but for himself, that would be a very good um, kind of foundation investment amount for him. But because of the other responsibilities put on him in the very early age that money now is, is used for charity which is the seed money yeah right and then that seed money is drained to a point where the seed money is no more yeah then you become as a liability as they are on yeah. you yeah um it's, it's, it's i don't know i don't know why i was going with this but <laughs> i don't know right? I, I have the answer i have the answer for yeah. this so how, do we, how can we just you know so um think of it think of cups right all lined up next to one another mm. right there is no way the other cups are going to be full mm -hmm. right because it's just not physically possible mm. it doesn't trickle down mm. right only one will get full at a time 
Now, if he wants to help everybody else, you have to, you have to change the organization of the cups. The cups need to go in a triangular mm. version. So one cup stays up, you know, then at the base three the and pyramid. then more a pyramid style, right? So that the first one gets full, as that one is overflowing, it fills into the lowering cup. And as those ones get full, they fill into the lower ones and so on and so on. That is the only organization that would help avoid the black tax. So what this means physically is that that one person that has the seed money needs to invest in himself first. Because when he does this successfully, it will overflow and then it will pour into the ones you're going to employ. It's, it's, it's people that will help you run your business. So as the money comes, you're going to employ other people. These people are going to become successful with training, mentorship, you know, promotion, whatever. They will now employ other people and so on and so on and so forth. You need to be full first. Mm -hmm. You need what, to be full what first. What about the, the naysayers? And what about how they criticize you? Oh, you have all the money and you just use it for yourself and your family. You don't care about your family who sold their land in the village to take your father abroad or yourself abroad like this thing how the one because i know look you'd be surprised how many people are going through this yes right mm -hmm. if yeah. you have something to share on that what do you think people should do to kind of put this thing different to be able to walk through that because at the end of the day we will never succeed it's just we draining each other mm -hmm. you know I, what think, I'm saying? Okay. I think that's that's again ties into taking care of yourself because yeah. educating your whole family out of that way of thinking is going to drain on you too yeah. much and mm. then you'll, you'll burn out so i think that's then on you to educate yourself how to put those boundaries in place how to even recognize your triggers when you're when your family when you go over to your family and you know they're saying oh give me something small or you know you haven't done this for me you haven't done that mm. okay mum I, I need two seconds to myself go back sit in your car breathe five seconds breathe in breathe out <laughs> it might sound ridiculous but even something simple as like a breathing technique could help you but you know you need to invest and pour into yourself first mm. because i i my, don't try and educate your whole family out of mm. that you It'll you'll suffer yeah, yeah you'll suffer mm. so yeah. to add to what abigail just said just remember that even jesus had enemies mm. right <laughs> That's true. Mm. even jesus mm. had enemies so you cannot please everybody you cannot become a people pleaser right mm. so s some eggs need to be broken in order to make the omelette mm -hmm. it's unavoidable you cannot avoid that mm. that process so you need to look straight obviously if you feel your life is in danger because they <laughs> might poison you <laughs> or they might go to the village and get the arrow Mm -hmm. that comes to you at night mm -hmm. do what is necessary mm -hmm. protect yourself protect your family protect your belongings mm -hmm. right there are means you know if it's self-defense mm -hmm. if it's uh, you know gate man whatever you need to do do what you have to do but remember that even the son of god he had enemies and he was feeding people with two loaves of bread and mm -hmm. fish mm -hmm. so you cannot please everybody mm -hmm. but again once you feed yourself and you're in a successful place right mm -hmm. the people who have been there for you the people who have been patient mm -hmm. they will come up they will show up you will see them mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. those who maybe had tried to because again what if you try to help the person whilst you are struggling and then they are not even grounded so all they are using that money for is for shoka for with the sheep and for this uh, the slay queens yeah you, you're throwing away you know mm -hmm. uh, seed money so that's that's not that's not smart i mean i have my own story about hotel one day but a friend we'll of love mine, to hear it yeah we we'll love to hear it yeah so helping people you you can really help somebody yeah come out of their trouble mm. and get them to a point where they are like well to do yeah and you just go in a slight dip of your own endeavors mm. and the person in that position don't want to reciprocate it uh, oh, it's, and, it's normal yeah yeah mm -hmm. so you having the hearts to help people yeah yeah it's it's gonna hurt you in the long run and i'm saying that this is a i don't know it's a black thing because i'm, I'm not sure yeah. you say you grew up with italians yeah and white people. oh it happens is it like that there too it happens in every race mm. the thing that we also have to understand um as um as black people is that if there are more successful black people 
that means there will be less and less envy and jealousy mm. right so an example the reason why we set up the company as a franchise as opposed to having a one man i'm owning everything is because we just sell the licenses mm. we don't need to have somebody then i'm counting his money take no no it's the work you do that's what you earn is the quality of work that you do that's what you earn let's start thinking as a cooperative right protecting our own assets but think as a cooperative so if i empower him i empower him i empower him i train him there will be less and less people relying on me mm. there, there there are really good time management books that teach this stuff so if more and more of us are successful like for example when we had the conversation i had no problem sharing with you where i get my source of inspiration because i know the more you are empowered the more i'm winning the more other people are empowered the more we are winning they will rely less on me for money less on me for information that would also give me the the leeway to do what i have to do and move on and move on mm. so the example would be open source technology and proprietary technology mm. open source always wins yeah mm. that's very true speak about cooperation a little bit yeah um i don't think we are very successful with that in ghana here i think i said cooperatives cooperatives not right? corporations no, so, yeah oh, no no cooperatives this is coop right so yeah uh, cooperative coop mm -hmm. Cooperative is um, it's a business model. Mm -hmm. It's just everybody is a shareholder in the yeah. business. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm speaking mm -hmm. about. That. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure we have a lot in Ghana here. Maybe we do not understand how it works, but um, it needs to be more common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we should come together as um, business owners. Example, we're both business owners and um, we want to s sell internet, right? So you have to identify your strengths. Mm -hmm. I need to know my strengths. And then we bring our strengths together to really? become complementary, mm -hmm. right? But this doesn't mean we need to share the bank accounts. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean we need to share the place of abode. Mm -hmm. We don't need to share our women, you know? Mm -hmm. These things, <laughs> you understand? Yeah. These things can happen because we are here solely to provide internet. Mm -hmm. Anything other than that, oh, Charlie, give me something I need to, no, no, no. This is not part of the T's and C's. This is something that is very clear in the, in the West, mm -hmm. documentation. Mm -hmm. We need to start applying documentation. It's over with the word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, I said I'll come. No, no, no. I need you to write it down. Send it to me. I sign it. I send it back to you. You sign it. I have a copy. You have a copy. We have solicitors involved. Mm -hmm. Anything that happens, breach of contract, I mm -hmm. breach, we go to the court. Mm -hmm. We need to start working more on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's kind of more of a cooperative. Cooperation, it, if there is a cooperative, there is a cooperation. But without that, then it's becoming, oh, my friend said I should do this. Oh, I like him. He's my brother. No, no. Good boundaries make good neighbors. Mm. Yeah. I, I interviewed a couple um, who also said the same thing that in Ghana, if you, you have like a family member within your business, yeah. you can't really properly scrutinize them. Because mm -hmm. even when they do something wrong and you kick them off, you it's, fire them yeah. down your other uncle or whatever will come and beg <laughs> will come in yeah you know? yeah so yeah Th this is where we just have to have clear defined lines of what business is and what family is yeah. because if you are going to collapse my business this is this is my source of income that means you're not really family you're not looking after me so this you know family ends here and business starts here mm -hmm. we need to take each and every one serious so the weekend are we going to eat fufu king cage or love whatever let's keep it at that but when it comes to earning money it's, it's not a joke we need to be serious and i think this is where the customer service um, um conversation can also come in is that why are we doing this mm -hmm. you know if the motive is solely and entirely because of money we need to think again it needs to be something bigger than money it needs to be a legacy it needs to be bringing back the diaspora, like the job you're doing, information giving. So I, 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 I always have this conversation with people and people are like, oh yeah, that's why you're broke or that's why you're this, that's why you're that, because you're, you're never thinking about the money. But money, if you think about it, is just paper. Mm. There must be something more. 
is either you are working from a place of trauma, mm -hmm. so you've never had anything as a child, so that's all you're doing just to show people, you know, me too, I did. No, you need to operate from a different, from a healed place. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we're providing a service, the reason why we're building homes for people to come and live in and, and have a certain quality of life is because we treasure freedom mm -hmm. and we understand what it means to be in a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. This is why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. So everyone should know why they're doing this and it should be anything other than money because then if you figured out this stuff, the money will come. Organized logistics operations? Limited, that's us. Yes, why please. organized? <laughs> So, um, in reality, my daughter, who is 16, she's with us, but not on camera. Mm -hmm. uh, her nickname is Olo, O-L-O. Mm -hmm. And this is because in Italian, the word for gold is Oro, O-R-O. -O. But when she was little, she couldn't pronounce the R. So she would always say Olo, Olo, Olo. So, I just wanted to name it after my daughter, but I wanted it to make sense. So, organized logistics operations LTD would be Olo, yeah, my daughter. All right, so, I mean, if you do have any final message uh, to friends and family watching, it could be friends you left in the UK, friends who even told you, let's go to Africa is a bad <laughs> idea, or you people you want to inspire in the US, in the US um, if you have that message, what would that message be? <laughs> That's a big one. Um, I would probably say follow your own path. Um, it took a while for us to kind of be confident to listen to sort of like that inner voice and what we really wanted to do without the people pleasing, without um, trying to, you know, avoid the black tax. You know, it took a very long while for us to be confident in that. And I would say it takes time for you to to practice and flex that muscle. So the first time you do it, you might be tripping up, you might be, you know, telling, confessing to your mom and dad, you know, uh, it might be difficult for you to do, but the second time it will be easier, the third time it will be easier, and then you're just, you're going off your own steam. Mm -hmm. So I really think stick to your own instincts on something um, and, and, and believe in yourself. It, it, it's all corny advice, but it's because it works. Mm, yeah. It's because it works. Like, like we were saying, like the bus stop boys, you know, they came with a vision that they wanted to clean Ghana. If they went to their mum and dad that first day and said, oh, I want to clean, oh, what money is that going to bring? You're just, you're just sweating out on, on you know, in yeah. the hot sun. <laughs> but now money is coming to them, sponsorships are coming yep. to them, celebrities are coming to them. Um, so even that small vision of cleaning has brought them to where they are today. Mm -hmm. so the twins in the train cleaning the tic or the TikTok videos, right? Mm -hmm. um, Oh, this are we talking Uganda? about the Busto the Boys? Busto yes, yeah, they're, in they're in Ghana. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Busto yeah. Boys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wale. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't he on a live, Shouted like, raising them, funds raised for them? Raised money for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. former yeah. president gave them money. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah they're, they're doing very yeah. well. And there's very, room very for well. everyone. Yeah. Ghana is a huge place. The Busto Boys can't clean the whole of Ghana. Exactly. So if even yeah. you're thinking, oh, I still want to do that, but the Busto Boys are taking over, do it. There's, it's a big place, yeah. I would say in conclusion, and advice for anyone out there, would be the writings on the temples in Egypt, mm. right? Yeah. Young man, know yourself. Young woman, know yourself. And we need to go deeper into what that means, which is not just, my name is Nana, I was born here, this is my age. It needs to go deeper into, what do I want? How do I want to come about these things? What was behind me, my ancestors? Just be curious about who you are. How are my feelings connecting me to these things, these events? What do I believe in? Belief is a massive part of who you think you are. So uh, yeah, know yourself. When you know yourself, you'd also know what you will bend for and what you will not bend for. Mm. And just follow your path, yeah. Mm. I like that. How do people find you? So, in the link in description, there is um, there would be a link to a um, a quiz. They can uh, follow all the instructions, answer all the questions, and then they'll go on to our website. We are on social media, 
but we are not very exciting. We are kind of old. So <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, old. I look at myself as a bit old. So I go under a um, a um, a uh, the word is not coming. The handle. Um, Social media handle. You need a, a handle. Uh, uh, a personal brand. Okay, okay. So I go under a personal brand, and uh, that would be Campbell Kits. Mm. It's a whole story behind it, but yeah, that's just where I show my creative expression. But to do business, just follow the link and go to our websites, and you can get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Thank you guys so much uh, for talking to me. Thank you, Hayford. Thank you. All right. Guys, where we are currently filming is called Gendu Place. Gendu Place is a co-working space located in East Legon, uh, very close to American House. You do have a, a whole restaurant here, you know, nice restaurant. You can literally just eat while you're working. They have high-speed internet. They also have a studio, right? Where I'm currently filming is it's a studio, basically. They also have another studio, you know, in addition to this, where you literally just have to walk in there. They have cameras, they have microphones, everything already set. You literally just have to just walk in there and start producing your content um, for a fee. So, you know, make sure you check it out. And uh, yeah, tell them you, you're coming from Web Nation Africa, you might just get a discount. And if it's your first time here, guys, please don't forget to like and share to friends and family. Um, yeah, subscribe. And uh, without further ado, let's just say bye-bye to the people uh, watching. All right. All right. Take care. Bye. Peace.